morning um, and welcome to Garnet's um, colloquium for um, regulation and governance. Before we get started, I want to acknowledge um, that many of us are on the lands that are um, traditionally owned by indigenous people of Australia or other places. Personally, I am sitting on the lands of the Kulin Nations. My name is Meredith Edelman. I'm a lecturer at the um, Monash Department of Business Law and Taxation. And I'm here to introduce um, Emeritus Professor John Braithwaite, who is, I believe, sitting on the lands of the Nunungal people in Canberra. Um, before I hand it over to John, I'd like to um, introduce him a little bit. Many of you already know his prolific work. Um, he has been writing in the fields of criminology, law, society, um, Republican political theory, um, and good governance generally um, in many, many subjects in many different areas over the course of decades. Um, his scholarship is world renowned and has been the inspiration for many different kinds of scholarship, um, including my own PhD, um, which I was honored to be able to work with him to do. Um, and so he is also, however, a giant fan of rugby league um, and other fun sporting events and just a wonderfully warm, personable and kind human being um, who I hope that many of you at, at some point have had or will have the opportunity to meet in person. Um, but if not, we have the pleasure of hearing his thoughts um, today, and I'll let him take over from here. Well, thanks very much, uh, Meredith, for that, uh, that uh, too, kind of, uh, too kind introduction. I, I, I too would like to uh, acknowledge the elders of the uh, Ngunnawal uh, peoples on whose land I am indeed uh, speaking and to congratulate you guys uh, and uh, admonish for the, the Garnet initiative but bringing people uh, uh, together as a network is something that's that's important and takes time and and patience but I really am delighted that uh, you guys have uh, have taken that uh, taken that step I've distributed a, a paper uh, that's available to you. I don't know if you've got it yet or not, but it, it's, it's one that'll be published next year in the annual review of law and social science on empirical evidence for and against restorative justice and responsive regulation. It's also on the integration of those two ideas to cover the weaknesses of restorative justice with the strengths of responsive regulation and vice versa. Uh, restorative justice is conceived in that essay as a way of selecting strategies to heal the hurts of injustice. Empathic empowerment of stakeholders who take turns to speak in a circle, uh, that's at the heart of its strategy for strategy selection. So it's conceived as a meta strategy. It's a way of, uh, it's a strategy for selecting strategies. Restorative justice complements responsive regulation at their best, they're mutually constitutive. Responsive regulation may work best when restorative justice is the first preference at the base of a pyramid of strategies. Responsive regulation involves listening, flexible deliberative choice among strategies that are arrayed in a pyramid. At the bottom of the pyramid are more frequently used strategies of first choice that are less coercive. While there's encouragement that restorative and responsive regulation can work better when they are integrated uh, and can work better than less dynamic top-down enforcement, the effectiveness of restorative justice and responsive regulation depends mainly on the efficacy of the interventions that are responsibly chosen. Um, the conclusion in that annual review paper that's available to you is really about getting on with the business of improving restorative justice and responsive regulation by improving the strategy choices that are made. 
And that's something that my ANU colleagues and I are seeking to accomplish through our work with EPA Victoria. And today I want to uh, apply that thinking from the annual review to corporate crime more broadly. In May this year, the operating company of the Hazelwood Power Plant and its open cut mine with a perimeter of 18 kilometres, it, it was fined $1.9 million for Occupational Health and Safety Act and Environmental Protection Act offences associated with the terrible fire that ignited uh, the mine. Uh, the major corporate owner and operator of the mine was the largest private sector energy corporation in the world, a French company, Engi, formerly Suez, that actually still trades as Suez in Australia. Uh, the, the name comes from the fact that it built the Suez Canal. Engi has revenue of $83 billion the year before sentencing. It owned 72% of the Hazelwood plant. The other 28% was owned by the Japanese giant Mitsui, which had annual revenue of 65 billion. How much do you think 1.9 million deters Mitsui and Engi? It took 35 days to extinguish the fire. Its smoke had health effects on the people of Morwell. Most estimates of the cost of the fire to Morwell were over $600 million. So was a fine of 1.9 million sufficient? It's in September 2020, Austrac seemed to take a great stride on this insufficiency of Australian corporate crime penalties. Westpac was fined 1.3 billion over money laundering offences, 700 times as much as Hazelwood. It was the biggest find in Australian corporate history. The Westpac share price did not take a notable uh, uh, hit on the day of the sentencing, uh, e even though the fine was much higher than the market expected. Within two months of sentencing, the Westpac share price had gone up 30%. Uh, a year earlier, the share price had taken a substantial hit, 18% uh, down, when Westpac started to respond with reforms to the depth of what the uh, Westpac investigation revealed. This is a general pattern. Uh, Jack Coffey, the doyen of US corporate crime research from Columbia University, has a new 2020 book, one of the things he points out is that the share price almost always goes up a bit when a corporate crime sentence is announced in the United States. On the other hand, it's true that when an investigation is announced or when an investigation re reveals some big new problem about the conduct a company has been involved in, uh, the share price does tend to go down in response to that. Now, that pattern is a big clue. And, you know, in a way, I'm a bit embarrassed to be putting this paper out on restorative justice and responsive regulation, which would be the way that I would summarise as best as I can what the evidence supports as a good way of regulating corporate crime up to this point in history. But it's a bit of a turning point in history. And uh, for those of you who are interested in corporate crime enforcement, it's, it's not a bad choice in the sense that um, uh, in the next 20 years, the landscape uh, will be very different. I don't know what it will be like, but certainly people will look back and view kind of stuff that Braithwaite was writing about restorative justice and and responsive regulation as a, as a way of conceiving what's hopeful about future responses as, as, as uh, an antiquated uh, contribution. So it's in that sense of embarrassment that I move forward with this presentation to give you, uh, give you the written paper for you to think about, those who are interested. Uh, so underlying that pattern that I've just described is uncertainty. Uh, uncertainty is an explanation for the pattern that corporates don't, unlike, don't like uncertainty that they can't control. So that when, once the sentence is handed down, 
they have certainty they've got something that they can deal with uh, and uh, they convince themselves and the shareholders that they can uh, deal with it. We actually see a similar pattern with garden variety uh, individual offending. Uh, when we did a randomized controlled trial on restorative justice in Canberra in the 90s that was led by Lawrence Sherman and he Heather Strang, 1,300 criminal offences were randomly assigned to a normal criminal trial versus a restorative justice conference. One of the very interesting findings was that those who were randomly assigned to restorative justice were more likely to say after the restorative justice conference that I would be really worried uh, if I had a future offence and I had to go to court in a prosecution. Whereas those who'd been randomly assigned to a prosecution who had just been to court for a prosecution were less worried about a future re-offence uh, where they ended up before the courts in a, in a prosecution. It, 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 in other words, that once you've been through that first prosecution, people in a similar way to corporations do come to the view of, ah, I've been there, that's something I can deal with. Uh, often in our kind and gentle ACT courts, it's, it's, it's not as horrifying an experience as they might have expected it to be based on what they've seen on TV about what happens to you when you end up uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a court case. So what's going on there is that when we randomly assign a case to restorative justice, we actually sharpen future deterrence. When we assign a case to prosecution uh, and conviction, we blunt uh, the sword of justice. Uh, we blunt the, the sort of Damocles aspect of, uh, of, de of deterrent justice. And we especially blunt deterrent justice if we overuse uh, deterrent justice. That's part of the pattern that I want to draw attention to here as well. Now, Sherman and his Cambridge colleagues have gone, down, gone on to do new recent randomised controlled trials where they've randomised garden variety uh, offences, criminal offences, to deferred prosecutions, uh, where the deferred prosecutions is combined with a lot of social support, rehabilitation services, you know, support for uh, social housing and so on uh, for the offenders. And their deferred prosecution cases re resulted in reduced crime harm, reduced cost of the justice system, uh, with those common offenders and resulted in increased victim satisfaction with the justice system in those cases that went to a deferred prosecution rather than an actual prosecution. So again, that's a part of the pattern I'm pointing to. Deferred prosecutions have been criticised in some US work as a degeneration of corporate criminal law toward a soft restorative justice approach. In a, stub a study published on the internet in 2019, however, by DeFranco, Small and Wahid, it reported that deferred corporate crime prosecutions actually deter better than completed prosecutions. It's the first genuinely systematic study with appropriate matching of US prosecutions and deferred prosecution cases. Uh, DeFranco, Small and Wahid found that firms subject to the deferred prosecution agreement experience lower stock market returns in the one to three year period following uh, the, uh, the, the enforcement compared to match firms that had been prosecuted. So if you, if you, have, if you do get prosecuted, you have a lower impact on your stock price than if you get a deferred prosecution agreement, which has a bigger impact. Um, because what's happening in the restored prosecution agreement is a process that's ongoing. That's the uncertainty point I'm trying to draw in to this thinking. So that was a systematic multivariate study of a substantial number of cases for which all financial variables were available. 109 firms that received a deferred prosecution agreement matched with a sample from 496 firms that were prosecuted. The effects were surprisingly large and long in duration. 
By the end of the first year following the enforcement action, stock market returns were 15 percentage points lower in deferred prosecution cases than in prosecution cases, and more surprisingly, 21 percentage points lower after three years. The stock market impact is, is it's just too large to be explained by the size of the fine voluntarily settled uh, in deferred prosecutions agreements, which averaged $96 million in their cases. The results were robust to various measures of stock market performance. Impacts on sales were not greatly less. By the end of the third year, sales in deferred prosecution firms were 11 percentage points lower compared to prosecuted firms. So completed prosecution delivered less market deterrence than deferred prosecutions. How can that be? Why do I think I've been so wrong in my past analyses of corporate deterrence? One possibility is that I never got it wrong in the first place, that uh, uh, DeFranco and the team got their analysis wrong. That really is a possibility. It's obviously a very controversial result. I've been writing endlessly <laughs> to them about this since 2019, and they've been saying, oh, well, we're redoing we're redoing the analysis, so I, but they've still left it up on the internet. So I assume what's going on there is that uh, when they've gone into the peer review process, people are shocked that convictions are delivering less deterrence uh, than deferred prosecution agreements, and they're asking them to redo their analysis. So they're asking them to redo their analysis. So the, the end of this story of uncertainty uh, might be when they redo their analyses, they do come up with a significantly uh, different result. When it comes to big banks and big pharma, uh, my experience of these organisations in the US and Australia since the 70s is that they have often remained recidivist criminalised corporations, whether they get a prosecution or a deferred prosecution or an enforceable undertaking, which is an Australian functional equivalent to a US deferred prosecution or non-prosecution agreement. More than 80% of US deferred prosecution agreements include specific provisions to improve corporate governance or corporate compliance systems. Changes to the board and the top management team are very common in these cases as a result of the adverse publicity and as a result of the enforcement action, whether it's a prosecution or a deferred prosecution. Corporate monitors were appointed in 30% of the US deferred prosecution cases. A chief compliance officer was often appointed to the top management group as part of the mandate. It may be that Brandon Garrett, what Brandon Garrett called structural reform deferred prosecutions that pursue deep governance reforms indeed do transform. Garrett illustrated with the 2005 KPMG deferred prosecution agreement to shut down its entire private tax practice, to cooperate fully in the investigation of former employees and to retain a former SEC chairman as an independent monitor for three years to oversee an elaborate corporate compliance plan program. Uh, in uh, my future book, which is called Macro Criminology and Freedom, I plan to argue that the most preventive feature of that kind of deferred prosecution undertaking uh, goes to corporate incapacitation rather than to deterrence. Incapacitation, reducing the capacity of the firm to reoffend, uh, is where their pre preventive potential mainly sits. If I'm right that many of the organisations subject to deferred prosecutions that demand, that do demand deep structural reform are systematically criminalised firms across more than one kind of crime, then the governance and compliance reforms mandated by the deferred prosecution may shut down other kinds of crime that have nothing to do with the offence for which the firm has been charged. It may do this to the point of reducing sales and profits as significantly as in the interim DeFranco results. Consider, for example, the monitor appointed to supervise reforms under the Bristol Myers Squibb deferred prosecution. The monitor asked the board to fire the CEO and he investigated entirely new corporate violations. 
If so, then why do CEOs not rationally defend this loss of sales and the sustained hit on the stock price by opting for a prosecution? One hypothesis is that CEOs do not defend the rational interests of the firm because cooperating with the prosecutor is the best hope for them personally to survive. A CEO who keeps in control during a negotiated settlement is likely to protect themselves from losing their job and from prosecution as an individual by cooperating constructively, offering quite a lot of reform, repair, to make the regulator, the prosecutor and civil society critics in the media happy enough. Even if a senior individual is going to be prosecuted, by cooperating to stay in control of events, the CEO can wield their power to ensure that they are not the full guy uh, uh, who, uh, who, who goes down, uh, that they are not what I described as the vice president responsible for going to jail uh, in my pharmaceutical industry research uh, in the United States. That there's, you know, you've got this office and your job is to take the heat for the CEO and after a period of faithful service, exposed to the threat of a corporate criminal prosecution, you'll be promoted sideways to a safe uh, uh, vice presidency. So CEOs can orchestrate that kind of phenomenon in a variety of ways. Prosecutions are also expensive, of course, and some ethical CEOs genuinely pre prefer to see money spent on victims than to put that money into the pockets of lawyers. CEOs also like negotiated settlements because they don't drag out as long as prosecutions do. They end the distracting, debilitating uncertainty in their lives from high profile enforcement. The deal can help end the reputational damage quickly. Brent Fissy and I long ago found empirically that reputation is important to CEOs of large corporations. It's important for its own sake. So the CEO of Monash cares about Monash's reputation independently of the financial consequences of a reputational hit that Monash takes in the higher education market. In the first restorative case uh, at the ACCC 30 years ago, Solomon's Carpet, Melbourne firm, uh, Christine Parker has written about this case. When the CEO refused to cooperate uh, with the restorative justice process, ACCC widened, widened the restorative circle to Mr. Solomon, the chair of the board. Mr. Solomon then fired the CEO, which is not such a restorative thing uh, uh, to do, uh, and then agreed to a much more formidable undertakings than would have been imposed by a court. So regulators grasped from the beginning uh, that, the nap, that the rational CEO is a cooperator who, if pressed hard enough by victims, by activist NGOs and by the regulator, will give up a bigger financial loss in an enforceable undertaking. That's why they often do give up more than the maximum financial penalties in the law, as they did in the Solomon's case. Of course, that doesn't happen when the regulator is captured, when victims and NGOs are quiescent, as predicted by responsive regulatory theory. There have been counts, countless occasions during this century uh, in the United States when there's been that kind of capture and quiescence, uh, and as they have in Australia, as the Banking Royal Commission concluded. So that's my story about why it's not such a great time for my uh, review uh, essay, there's this uncertainty about this very striking result from uh, the Trafranco team in the US uh, and all the uncertainty associated with their reanalysis and the update of their data. And there's also uncertainty surrounding another important study, and that's the first meta-analysis that's been done on corporate uh, deterrence by the University of Maryland uh, team, Shelbussy et al., which was uh, published in 2016 in Criminology and Public Policy, and they found that corporate deterrence does not work. 
that there was not a significant effect size of the, uh, co the corporate deterrence variable in the, uh, the meta-analysis and they were man um, um, able to pull together a surprisingly large number of corporate uh, deterrence studies uh, 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 in that work. Um, they found that regulatory inspections works, um, uh, but it really refuted the kind of position that I had for a long time uh, uh, in this field. So what I would argue that, well, um, it's very hard to find a criminologist who believes that if you reintroduce the death penalty for rape, you're going to reduce the amount of rape in the society. Uh, uh, and, and, and there is there are good evidence-based re reasons for believing that that law reform would not work. However, there are also, I, would, I used to argue, uh, best known example is an article with Gil Geis in 1982, we argue that while deterrence doesn't work very well for common crime, it works very well for corporate crime. And there's every reason to believe that through delivering more deterrence, we can uh, in, improve compliance in corporate criminal law. Well, it increasingly looks that that, that, that that view is wrong, but it's not totally wrong in the sense that if you look more carefully at the Shelbuzzi et al meta-analysis, what it's saying that, okay, if you look at a, a deterrence effect, it doesn't work, but what does work is regulatory mix. So that means that if you have deterrence embedded as in an in a enforcement strategy that has a good, rich mix of strategies, uh, then deterrence will work as a contributor uh, to that broader pattern. And that's, that's also what responsive regulatory uh, theory uh, says. Okay, another big, law, uh, another big learning across these new analyses is that most corporate reform and most corporate penalization precedes sentencing. It doesn't come from the sentence. Think of the uh, Deepwater Horizon BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. There was a criminal fine there of 1.3 US billion uh, dollars in that case, but that paled in comparison to 28 billion US dollars that had been paid by BP in advance of that criminal case coming to sentence. These were involuntary payouts of various kinds to uh, fishermen for pollution, voluntary pollution cleanup, uh, uh, and some civil settlements. Uh, a, a hugely greater amount, uh, amount of uh, uh, money. That being the case, that reality that most of the penalty precedes sentencing, among other things, is a fundamental, in, fundamental undermining of the criminal law doctrine of proportionality. Well, what does it mean to say that 1.3 billion is a proportional punishment when it pales in insignificance besides the 28 billion? The process is the punishment is the main part of the punishment in all areas of criminal law, as Malcolm Feely said in the title of his famous book. Now, that pattern has been there for a long time in the corporate crime literature. Uh, a book by Wildman on US antitrust enforcement in 1978 is a hugely neglected piece of work. And it also showed that in cases that resulted in a loss in an antitrust case for a major American corporation, they will have made all sorts of payouts and new compliance policies put into place uh, before the trial being completed, even in monopolization cases, doing voluntary divestment, selling off part of their business to say, there you are, we're not a monopolist, we're so, we've, we've sold off this part of the business in, 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 in order to get a, a better outcome in the trial and get the case over with uh, more, more, more quickly. And this proportionality creek uh, critique also comes up in garden variety uh, restorative justice as well. When I'm teaching the students, I often refer to a case we had more than 20 years ago uh, 
uh, where a, a group of young people had uh, taken a car and they hadn't stolen the car. They just went joyriding in the car. But in the process of joyriding, it was an old jalopy. They did uh, damage uh, to the clutch of the, of the car. And so the victim presented at the restorative uh, justice conference with this group of uh, uh, teenagers uh, with the complaint that, look, he's a struggling person from a working class family. And now that he doesn't have his car, he can't, he can't hold his job. Uh, he needs that car to get out uh, to the job that he's valued. So that it's, the, it's while they were just having a bit of, a bunch of kids having a bit of fun, they thought, they've actually had a dramatic impact on his life. The outcome of that conference, uh, one part of the outcome of the conference was one of these young people was from an extremely wealthy family. And uh, it was last year of high school and he'd done well at high school and his father had uh, given him a Porsche as a, uh, uh, as a present. Uh, for the so his father suggested at the conference that he hand over his Porsche to this uh, working class uh, gentleman who was the victim who was at risk of losing his job so he could drive the, drive the Porsche to his uh, working class and and everyone thought this was a this was a great idea but of course the uh, the lawyers reacting to it were saying well, this is a pretty shocking uh, example of disproportionate punishment because here we have a child who's the first offender uh, and it's not even a theft of a car, it's just a joyride and a Porsche is worth 200000 or $300,000. So we have an effective, you know, we have this huge six-figure uh, sum uh, in a fine. So if, if the child had gone to court, uh, there is no way uh, that the youth court would have imposed a penalty of that magnitude uh, in the case. But of course, the child did not do that. The child wanted to do what the family suggested that they thought was a just outcome, uh, that uh, he should thenceforth do without his car and uh, the victim should have the car, that there was a kind of social justice in that, especially because of his privileged... Uh, 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 position and so there was no thought of anyone taking uh, the disproportionate disproportionality involved to uh, to court. So let's return to Hazelwood. Uh, this kind of proportionality analysis may, may have been true of, of Hazelwood. Uh, Hazelwood announced closure of the mine and the power station three years before sentence. That was an action of greater environmental and economic consequence than the 1.9 million fine. I'm not sure how much of the reason for the closure was the prosecution hanging over the head of the company. That's a question my ANU colleagues, Miranda Forsyth, Deb Cleland, uh, Val Braithwaite, Felicity Tepper and I are still exploring uh, with our EPA college, colleagues uh, in our ARC linkage. One of the things environmental activists in Morwell wanted was at least $10 million in seed funding to start a large solar farming industry in Morwell to replace employment in coal uh, with jobs in renewables. 10 million was also peanuts for Engie or Mitsui, but the people of Morwell did not get this out of the sentencing process. Engie, pursuant to a new policy of shifting energy production to renewables, voluntarily closed the power plant and the coal mine in 2017. Corporate power ultimately took the most decisive step toward repairing harm after state regulatory power had failed to do so for decades. This was a mine that was uh, uh, the worst contributor uh, to our carbon challenge in Australia. Uh, it was a mine that was always going to have a catastrophic fire one day. During the life of the mine, fires that broke out and triggered regulatory notification were, were reduced from 250 a year, 250 fires a year to 100 a year, a very still an unacceptable risk, of course. My colleagues on this project and I are pondering the fact that a reforming new Paris CEO 
Isabel Cochere was appointed in 2016 to transform Engi globally to become a greener organization that shifted its investment to renewables. It was Cochere who took the decision to decommission Hazelwood and to sell the Loyang B power, Brown Power Coal Station in Victoria in 2018, and to announce an intent for closing all such emissions intensive coal fire power generating facilities worldwide. That induced internal conflict on her board. And this year, quite, quite recently, she was replaced as CEO. A good restorative justice strategy would have been to ask Kosher during this 2016 to 2020 window of opportunity to come out to meet the citizens of Morwell, rather as the ACCC did in its early restorative justice cases in the 1990s, uh, as discussed in the research on that of Brent Fissy and Christine Parker. Morwell activists could then have, been, have made their pitch to co-share for Engi to fund 10 million or more for their solar farm development and other new green employment opportunities in Morwell to compensate for the impending loss of jo jobs from this community's historic commitment to coal. Uh, this was the kind of project that interested Koshere. She opened a large wind farm in Australia in 2019. It would have been a good kind of innovation for the prosecutor or the judge to enable an, a restorative encounter with the CEO long before conviction to allow a pitch from the people of Morwell to Isabel Koshere to start funding that green investment that was so aligned with her values and her company's new corporate strategy at that historical conjuncture. And, and that also would have aligned with the state of Victoria's plans for the future of Morwell. A restorative corporate law imagination requires conversations with reformers inside corporate offenders, uh, as Christine Parker's work also shows, to open the door to contestation of big agonistic ideas and big restorative ideas. It's a tragedy for Morwell and for the planet that this precise kind of healing conversation uh, did not happen at Hazelwood. A reason may have been misplaced fear of being anything less than totally punitive toward the corporate offender in a high profile case. Precisely what Morwell needed was massive investment in renewables jobs by investors with pockets as deep as Engie's and with support from all levels of Australian government for a renew Morwell. So in my paper for the annual review of law and social science, it argues that the evidence tells us that restorative justice and responsive re regulation work well enough. The evidence in, in support of restorative justice is stronger. Um, but responsive regulation also, you know, it kind of has to be, responsive regulation has to be true to some degree because what it involves in essence is trying one strategy after another until you find one that works. Uh, so in a sense, it, it, if you try long enough, you must eventually find something that works. So uh, th there's gotta be something in that. But then the main pitch of that paper that's available to you is what we've really got to do now is work on improving the layers of strategies uh, in, that, that are invoked in restorative justice processes and in responsive regulatory processes. So if we think of the new EPA Act, which will come into effect uh, next year, it, for example, has provisions for better environment plans that corporates can develop and propose uh, to EPA. So Victoria might look forward with a politics of hope that companies like Suez in future might put in place a better environment plan that prevents events like the Hazelwood fire uh, long before they put Victorians at risk again. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um... We do have a few questions already. Um, the, the first question asked for us to share the references that you made. And I've provided links for the DeFranco Small and Wahid paper. Um, and I think one other, the, 
the Shelbusi, Simpson, Rory, and Alper paper on what works on corporate crime deterrence. If there are other specific papers that people want links to, um, please do let us know. As John mentioned, his paper is forthcoming, um, and I'm happy to share that privately with anyone who requests, um, but we're going to try to keep that from going completely public before yeah. it gets published to comply yeah. with all sorts of rules. That's right. We didn't want to send it to everyone, but we sent it to the students. But if you want to write to me, I'm sure I'll consider the submission. <laughs> Uh, the second question that I received was from somebody who asked whether banks and big pharma are captured by their sort of internal and sector, sector cultures and whether penalties need to be greater or indeed shared. In other words, if one bank does something dodgy and gets fined, are all the banks at that level also sort of or should be fined or subject to some sort of penalty that might incentivize altering the corporate culture that exists, not only in the primary offending organization, but across the sector? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I mean, in, in, in practical terms, it comes up in a lot of uh, areas of regulatory enforcement. Uh, for example, uh, areas of considerable progress across the last uh, 50 years have been with the safety of nuclear reactors. Some will regret that because like me, they would want all nuclear reactors to, to just close. But it nevertheless is the, is the case that the risk of automatic, automated shutdowns of nuclear re reactors has reduced a hundredfold since the Three Mile Island disaster and the Chernobyl disaster. And that has been about the industry worldwide being persuaded that they are, as Joe Reese puts it, a community of shared fate. So if one, if, you know, if there's another Chernobyl, we're all going to be shut, and we're all going to be shut down. So in that sense, we all are punished whenever one of us is punished. And so we, we need to collaborate. Uh, we need to, uh, so there was, after Chernobyl, there was twinning of all of the former Soviet nuclear power plants with, with German power plants, for example. So that, there, that, was, that was one of the important strategies. They were willing to share intellectual property. Uh, I was talking about that with the uh, Japanese uh, Ministry of International Trade and Industry this week on the regulation of driverless cars and electric uh, cars. Um, an issue like what happens if one of the big Japanese manufacturers puts its, uh, uh, its driverless cars on the road and has zero accidents, but one of the others has significant numbers of accidents. Uh, do, you, do you then want to go uh, to the, the car manu Japanese car manufacturer with the safer algorithm and say, we want you to share that al algorithm with your competitor um, in order to save lives and in but in order to underwrite the legitimacy of the of, of the industry so that's the big sense in which that happens in terms of actually actually imposing fines on the whole industry partly for that reason when there is a genuine community of shared fate you don't you don't need to um, but um, uh, yeah, these these will be hard uh, questions as uh, new AI technologies uh, pose new risks for sure. Thanks, John. Um, I'm just going to keep going with the questions that have been sent to me. Um, we have a participant who asks whether. Um, and I'm going to quote here. I'm not sure whether I got it right that you meant what you mentioned about a French company and a Jap Japanese company, uh, which featured in corporate crime as they're in Australia. But if foreign companies are involved in corporate crime here in Australia, who would have jurisdiction to prosecute the case? Would these companies be covered by the jurisdiction of the Australian courts? What are the conditions by which these companies could be prosecuted under Australian courts and laws? And what would happen if these companies would submit themselves to the restorative justice process or jurisdiction of the Australian courts? Um, and what should be the fine if they were to be found out to be liable of the crime that they're accused of? Um, so I, I think that I'm going to assume that this question is about 
um, actions committed by foreign companies in Australia as opposed to Australia's a, a question about whether or not Australia has or should extend some sort of universal jurisdiction for acts occurring outside of its borders. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, in the in the Hazelwood case, it was a case where there was a Hazelwood operating company, which was more than 70% owned by Engie, with the other 28% owned by uh, Mitsui, and they were making the important operating decisions, including the decision to shut it down uh, completely. But they were insulated from too much of uh, too much damage. Uh, by virtue of the fact that it was, you know, this was an independent Australian subsidiary, which, yes, could be prosecuted under uh, Australian law and was prosecuted and convicted uh, under Australian law. But it's also interesting in another sense. I mean, employee, uh, Suez uh, is a very, you know, always was a very big company. Uh, in Australia, you know, we see their trucks in picking up our garbage in every corner of this uh, of this continent and doing lots of other things. And it was interesting, you know, the separation of responsibility was was interesting to me there. So, you know, you you had the local Hazelwood employees doing a magnificent job all of them coming into work to fight the fire on the day, but you did not have Suez employees come from across the country. Uh, it was thought of as uh, the, the Hazelwood operator as quite a separate uh, entity from Suez. Thanks, John. So I have a question from Mary, who wanted to ask it, go ahead and ask it live. And Mary, it looks like you're on mute. All right, Mary, we're gonna, I'm gonna wait for Shahab to maybe activate your mic. And in the meantime, I'm going to ask one, another question that's come in through the Q&A um, while we figure out getting you live. Um, so we have, where is the middle ground between tough governance or rule of law for protecting the environment and society um, versus softer ones, but attracting investment? I think one part of the answer to that is that none of this pattern of results is about a defense of deregulation. Because, uh, I mean, the, the University of Maryland meta-analysis does show that regulatory inspection works. So we need regulatory agencies that are, have a lot more street level inspectors out there kicking the tires, making demands uh, of corporations, um, uh, checking uh, that their self-regulatory initiatives are not just pieces of paper, but that involve uh, uh, the, you know, an environmental or public uh, public safety reality uh, in some ways. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's also the case that uh, at the end of the day, the middle ground is that deterrence is important so that, you know, if, you, if you're going to be able to negotiate really big structural things, I mean, uh, Jack Coffey in his book argues for 20% equity fines. Because, you know, because of the story I've told about BP, about Westpac, and about Hazelwood, the fine never gets up to a level where it's uh, any, any more than like a, a parking fine for a very wealthy individual uh, person. So no, no surprise that, that the, the main impact is, is all about the inconvenience of being tied up in the legal system rather than the size of the actual penalty. But Coffee argues that the only way to get to a size uh, that does not cause a lot of workers to lose their jobs and the kind of scenario uh, we had with the Arthur Anderson going bankrupt after a corporate uh, prosecution 
uh, is to have equity fines. So he wants a 20% equity fine in the big cases where 20% uh, uh, the penalty is that 20% of your shares will be handed over to a victim compensation fund to clean up the Gulf of Mexico, to clean up more wealth, whatever it, uh, it is. And the only way you can evade that is to negotiate a very strong uh, deferred prosecution uh, agreement. So, and I think he's right in that, that you need that kind of deterrent leverage. But responsive regulatory theory, of course, is, says that what you're trying to do is avoid these grand battles in the courts uh, a bit more than we do and do more of that sitting down with a CEO uh, like the CEO of Engie during that period who might have actually responded to that kind of pitch. I'm really glad you asked that question. It looks like Mary's question um, was either already answered through your talk um, or it went away. But I have a question that I'd like to ask. Um, so I recently wrote a piece um, in which I'm starting with from John Coffey's argument about the equity fine. And I think you know that my expertise is in, in Chapter 11 restructuring. And my argument is essentially that a model based on that could actually implement this equity fine. And I made an argument that Rio Tinto um, in its destruction of the Yukon Gorge might consider giving equity to the PKK people as a form of recompense for the harm that they've done. And that part of the reason that that's attractive is not just that it, it's a significant um, award that um, provides a lot of financial compensation, but also that it provides actual decision-making authority to the people who are harmed. And in that way, it actually embraces this sort of Republican norm of, um, of shared decision-making and non-domination. Um, and my question is that I was sort of unexpectedly contacted last night by a couple of media organizations who thought that I had something really interesting to say about the Yukon Gord and Rio Tinto, the Gorge and, and Rio Tinto. Um, and they want, they asked me questions that really got to the heart of this question of, you know, is there any fine that would be sufficient given the sort of massive size of Rio Tinto? Um, is there any sort of sanction uh, that would be sufficient? And do the recommendations that came out of the, the committee go far enough to require an actual change. Um, and I think that they were looking for this sort of short soundbite that said, no, it needs to be harsher. Um, and they, they didn't really like my response, which said something along the lines of, well, we should really ask the PKKP people and we need them to be involved in what, what is sufficient should be a decision for them. And so my question for you is, um, you know, how would you have answered that question? And what do you think, um, you know, maybe what do you think I should have said? <laughs> oh, I don't know what you should have said, but I, <laughs> but I do think, I, I do agree with you that uh, law reform, that creates the possibility of a large equity fine in a case like that, can bring the corporate offender to the negotiating table in a much more meaningful, fashion, uh, that if, if the corporation is tough enough, I mean, in, in cases like Solomon Carpets and so on, it's all very well uh, for, you know, us old guys from the ACCC and those days to say, oh, well, when you fail in your negotiation with the CEO, because the CEO is such a tough nut, widen the circle and bring, in this case, the chair of the board in, so you, you know, you, you start the restorative negotiation with the executives of the company who are directly, directly responsible for the offence. If they don't agree, you don't say, or oh, I will see you in court. No, you can say, mm, we're really disappointed that you're not willing to be responsive to these legitimate demands from victims. Let's both go away and think about it. But then when you reconvene, you're bringing in a Mr. Solomon or someone higher up the organisation in the hope that he will be, you, you will eventually widen the circle to the point where you get the more socially responsible actor in the circle. But at the end of the day, if the chair of the board, if the Mr. Solomon figure is an even tougher nut uh, than the CEO uh, uh, he has appointed, 
Um, he's not going to fire that CEO. He's going to pat that CEO on the back, uh, tough it out in court and get a low penalty in court. So uh, you want to, for those cases, you, you do want the access to, to a tough deterrent penalty. And I would agree with coffee, like a, a quite hefty equity fine as an option. Thank you. Um, so I have another question from Jennifer Hill. She says, thanks for a marvelous presentation. In the Banking World Commission, Commissioner Hain took the view that real responsibility for the misconduct identified laid with the banks themselves, as well as the directors and senior managers of the banks. He also took the view that perverse incentives in remuneration structures were very important. She's interested in your views on potential liability for directors and senior managers who may be unaware of particular offenses at the time of their commission, but may nonetheless have been responsible for implementing a remuneration model that either provides perverse incentives for misconduct, like Wells Fargo, or provides perverse incentives for inadequate monitoring to detect misconduct. For example, it's been suggested that some of the banks could have had more expensive technology to detect some of the relevant offenses. Yeah, uh, Jenny, that's a big theme in, in Jack Coffey's 2020 book, that he argues that these low penalties, like a billion dollars or three billion US dollars, they seem high to lay people, but they're not going to be high enough to deter because of the realities of these incentive structures, which are delivering long run uh, and sh more importantly, short term, good uh, stock market returns to the, uh, to the bank or whatever, uh, you know, Rio Tinto, whatever the uh, kind of organization that is uh, at, at issue. And that's part of his uh, pitch for equity fines and of course another part of the pitch for equity fines if you think of when you get a total unraveling uh, at the time of the global financial crisis where you have these corporate actors saying well this is working really well for us we're all raking in fantastic bonuses at the moment but we're taking those bonuses out of the out, out of the company and putting them somewhere else in a funeral parlor or some very uh, secure uh, business looking forward to COVID perhaps, um, that's gonna make uh, long-term safe profits in future because one day, uh, probably not far off, this, is, this system's all gonna crash. So it works for me personally to take out my fantastic bonuses. It works for me if I'm the director uh, to pay those bonuses so you know you need an enforcement strategy that cuts through all of those incentive structures and then when they when when they do crash you also need to do not what obama did uh which was to say oh well we'll we'll give you a lot of uh ta u.s taxpayers uh cash to uh prop you out we we, we won't we, we decided not to do that for lehman brothers and that in retrospect looks like it might have been a mistake. So we'll do it for all of these uh, other big financial corporations. Far better to do what G Gordon Brown and some other Europeans did was say, well, we'll give you a lot of uh, uh, taxpayers cash to bail you out. Uh, but what you, will, what you will give us in return uh, is a very large parcel of shares in your company uh, in the name of the British state, the German state. Uh, so it's at various levels that I think coffee is right, that the, has always been right, that the equity fine uh, is, a, is, a, is a key piece in thinking through that challenge, Jenny. Right, right, thank you. Um, we have another question. Um, Ch China's social credit system, this is, very different subject in some sense. China's social credit system has been considered very useful and effective regulatory tool by nudging citizens to obey the laws. However, it is understood in the Chinese context. By way of technology, everyone is subject to a complex web of surveillance, thereby leading to compliance. 
While many have criticized this regulatory model, one may also argue that the rating or ranking system sort of mechanisms that have been employed by Western countries essentially have similar functions. Uh, this question is, per, the questioner is interested in your view on the use of new technology or rating in ensuring compliance and legitimacy issues you can think of in this context. In particular, do you think that there is a big difference between the Chinese social credit regime and the rating ranking tools commonly used by Western society? I'm afraid I know nothing about the uh, Chinese uh, social credit thing, but I'll, look, I'll, I'll make a couple of comments. One, uh, in spite of my ignorance, but I really can't answer the Chinese comparativism part of it um, and welcome you to come back on it. I mean, on nudging, nudging can help in small ways, but a nudge is only a nudge. It's not a structural shift. Uh, uh, and, and in that, you know, the meta-analyses on nudge uh, shows that nudge strategies can be helpful but the effect sizes are really quite small. Uh, so, you know, if, if our supermarket puts a whole lot of chocolate bars at the checkout, we might buy an extra chocolate bar every now and then, but it's not going to massively change the amount of profits that Coles makes from selling us sugar. Um, that's just one little uh, nudge among, among many, I suppose. Uh, but ratings agencies, uh, I mean, I think we probably should have had a socialist solution uh, to the conduct of ratings agencies after the global financial crisis. You have a domination of that market in the West by Standard and & Poor's and Moody's, and they were basically rating anything, had a clear understanding that a game of pass the parcel were going on, and they were among those who were made, making good money by finding that companies were financial institutions were solvent when they, in fact, were not solvent. Uh, I would have liked to have seen uh, the European Union respond to that reality by setting up a European publicly owned ratings agency to compete in the market with Standards and Poor's and, uh, and, and Moody's with a public regarding corporate charter uh, in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. And, and so it may be that the, uh, there is something to learn from the greater security of the Chinese uh, financial system in that kind of socialist way as well. I'm not sure. Thank you. Sorry. I uh, here we go. I have another question, um, and this one is about ethical conduct. Um, and this is, I think, about in, it's whether or not you see the need for international organizations um, like the World Bank, UN, IMF, to be granted diplomatic immunity from any legal actions in their member countries for unlawful conduct acts they may conduct. For example, UN peacekeeping forces in Haiti are infecting local society with communicable diseases or raping women and not getting, and getting away with it. Um, this question is asked reflecting the reality in which those international organizations are protected by immunity, which makes them in many cases, as captioned in voluminous literature, is to be reckless, and what governance is needed to hold them responsible. So I think that question is really sort of an interesting one about whether approaches that we take to corporate governance and regulating corporate mis misbehavior should be and can be applicable to international organizations and what kinds of incentives immunity might, um, might create. I'm not at all comfortable with that international uh, immunity. And uh, th that is something that, that needs to be reformed, uh, can be uh, reformed, I mean, especially with peacekeeping, for example, you know, most peacekeepers these days, wealthy countries don't send out many peacekeepers these days. They're mostly, most keep, peacekeeping is provided by poor countries and it's partly a, uh, a, a money-making concern. It's the wealthy countries that are, you know, that are worried about being uh, uh, picked on by developing 
uh, countries after they've been so generous as to provide their peacekeepers. Uh, but you, you can have contracts with peacekeeping providing states that say, well, you know, you know if you commit a rape, you, you've got to be vulnerable. Uh, if you commit a rape in Afghanistan, you've got to be vulnerable to the Afghan courts if you have uh, uh, allegedly raped an Afghan uh, woman. And there are many countries which would accept uh, those terms, and there are other countries that would not. And I think by doing more peacekeeping with countries that will accept, uh, that will give up that kind of immunity, we can step by step make the world a better place. Thank you so much, John. Um, sorry, I'm, I, I have a question that's not really a question so much as a um, request for the, the coffee papers. And I just want to confirm that the, the, the new book that you're referring to is Corporate Crime and Punishment, The Crisis of Under Enforcement, which is being published by Penguin Random House. Is that right? It is out, yeah, it is out, yeah. It is out, yeah, no, and I think I just found the link. It's, it's only $34 or $35 um, in the hardcover. So it, it looks like a, a great read. Um, I actually don't think I have any other questions. So, um, so if there are any other questions, please do, do send them in. Um, but John, this has been just a really fantastic talk and I, I really appreciate it. I know that the rest of the, the Garnet members really appreciate it too. So um, on behalf of myself and the rest of the organizing committee, I really do want to convey our thanks for your joining us, for your time, for your thoughts and your wisdom. Um, and I wish you a really happy new year and, and holiday season. Um, and I think the same goes to every, all the attendees. We'd really, we really appreciate your joining. We appreciate your questions. We appreciate your attendance and your interest and want to thank you for, for joining. Um, and wanted to remind you as well that tonight at 6 to 7.30, we have another public presentation. It's a panel on publishing and regulatory governance with some really distinguished speakers um, talking about how to approach uh, um, publishing strategy um, in this field, which is so interdisciplinary and so interesting to so many of us. So thank you everyone for joining and thank you particularly for John um, for joining us and giving such a fantastic talk. Thank um, you for your terrific questions. So I think I will end the uh, webinar now. <laughs>